Hey folks, welcome back to the next video of my 1967 Triumph T100C build. I'm calling it the Tarantula. It's an old desert sled survivor. So last video, I rebuilt the top end. And as promised, we're gonna tackle the primary side this time and also a little bit on the timing side. I was all gung-ho on using the original ignition system, which is called an ET ignition energy transfer. They basically took the, the idea behind a magneto and made it as difficult as possible. And it's very convoluted to set up and I didn't want anything to do with it. Even though it worked, I didn't want it. So I'm going a different route. I am going to use what I think is probably the best kit on the market now. The technology we have today is so much better than even a few years ago. This is the Electrix World. Uh, this is the non-lighting kit because I'm not running any lights. And it's a whole ignition that basically works off the crank side. This goes up to a little control module that you can hide under your tank. And that plugs into the coils and that's it. No battery. No fussing with uh, like electronic ignition on the timing side. And what's great is now the timing cover, you remove all the points and everything. It literally just becomes a cover you can pull on and off, which is really nice on these bikes. A lot like a premium unit would be. On this video, I'm going to get the whole primary side together, set up the electrics kit, and see how it goes. All right, let's dig in. So because I'm getting rid of the whole original rotor stator system, I can pull the... Uh, stator off and pull it through. I've already removed the little locating pin that was in the, uh, the gear here. So on the original system there's a pin here and you would put the, the rotor on and you'd locate it into one of these different options and that could affect your timing. But we're getting rid of all that so I removed the pin so now it's just simply the, uh, the motor gear. And we'll remove the little spacer here. All right, so this is the oil seal to keep the fluids in the primary side from going into the motor. The spring always faces the side with pressure or the side that you don't want to contaminate. So that's why the spring faces out. Now, you can't really get some pliers in there, but what you can do is kind of tap around the edges a little bit. Kind of loosen it up. Right on the lip. Okay. You should be able to pull this out. Let's see. Well, you can spin it. There we go. So now you can see your main bearing right there. I removed the uh, final drive sprocket off so I could kind of coat the other side of the needle, needle bearing in some more of my uh, Loctite 518 just to kind of seal it up and prevent any sort of uh, maybe oil leakage if, if it happens. Just a little caution right there. So now what I got to do is I got to pull that out. Before you can pull it out, on the bottom, there's a little uh, keeper for the cable right here that you need to remove. Okay, so you need to kind of pull it apart. Sometimes it's, this could be one of the most difficult things ever. Come on, baby. I had to pull it back through and cut off some bunched up... Uh, cable covering over here so let's see if we can get it out now Ugh. it doesn't want to pull those bullets through i tell you oh. goodness gracious right now is actually probably the best time to add the breather hose you need about two feet of this stuff to get to the uh, oil tank and this is 5 16 but the fitting on this is incredibly tight. I'm sure it's some sort of weird Triumph size, but I use my uh, heat gun to warm up the tubing just a little bit to push it all the way on. And I've had this thing fall off on me before on a few of my bikes. So although it doesn't say to have a clamp in there, I put one in there and it just clears the sprocket. So I am going to take this opportunity while it's easily accessible to put the uh, electrics kit on, at least feed the wires through. 
I'll get it all set up later. But right now, before I put all the covers and sprockets on, this is when you want to do this. I'm just going to set it on for now with no particular orientation in mind. Okay, now we can put the rest of the uh, sprocket assembly on. So make sure this is nice and clean because it's riding on that oil ring. Get on there, baby. So normally I just hold this with like a chunk of chain and then I tighten it up. But I learned this from uh, Mr. A.J. Richter, watching his channel. Let's see if I can do it. All right. Reusing my tab washer because I'm thrifty. Just a dab of blue Loctite. So now I can hold this pretty good. So I wish I had the proper uh, socket for this. So I ended up using, where's it at? A giant one and a half inch. Okay. Certainly feels like it's in there pretty tight. So now I can bend that tab washer over. Use my best screwdriver. Just kidding. All the clutch parts are nice and clean from the parts washer. All right, everything's nice and clean and ready to put some oil seals in here and the uh, sprocket cover on here and its new oil seal. So I'm going to start with the, the motor oil seal. I'm going to use a little bit more of the uh, Loctite 518 on the outside of it. So I'm going to go ahead and put the spacer on now. I'm going to use the 518 again. That nub means nothing. I have a feeling it was from casting. You can see it right there where it feeds the aluminum into the, uh, the mold. I went ahead and sprayed Hylomar on both sides of the gasket. Simply fit her on. Going to use just a dab of blue Loctite, just a small bit. And I'll put in all the others. All right, for the clutch center, full disclosure. I tried to open this up twice with my uh, Harbor Freight uh, driver and it broke both of my bits and I was about ready to give up but I ended up ordering another set of bits. Just uh, some $10, a $10 set off eBay but they're supposedly a little bit maybe better than the other ones from Harbor Freight and I was pretty nervous that it wasn't going to open it up because I already kind of messed up the screw. But it worked pretty good, no problem. I had to kind of grind the sides just a little bit to fit in the slot. Pound it in so it makes a nice good contact. Then you put your driver on. And they came out pretty good, so let me unscrew these. 
and I just tapped it out on the floor. So those are the old uh, Cush Drive rubbers in there. So we're going to replace these. So you can see how wasted these are. I actually made a mistake. I should have opened it from the other side. Actually, I did originally, and that's the side I boogered up pretty bad, so I went from the back side, not remembering that the clutch center, the clutch hub, I mean, can only really reach on one side because of the, uh, the gap right there. So I guess I'm going to have to open up the other side too. This is exactly what I'm talking about. Brand new bit. Rip to shreds. These things are in there so tight. All right, I didn't give up. I heated the screw uh, bosses from the inside. And I had one more longer bit, and I gave it another shot, and they came out. Okay, the clutch center's all been cleaned up. I've uh, replaced some of the boogered up screws with some good ones that I had in my spares. And I've got my new uh, clutch rubber, Cush Drive, here. So what we're going to do is we're going to put the uh, the back cover on first. Now, if you look at the clutch center, one side is deeper than the other. That's the back side, so that when this thing goes in, that this side is can uh, be a little bit uh, below flush of this back surface right here. This is the side that the thrust washer goes on. So I'm going to line up the holes. Use a little bit of blue Loctite. It might be a good idea to uh, chase these threads before you put these screws in. I've had, I've had some in instances in the past where nothing you would do would screw would let the screw screw in. Okay, make sure your impact is rotating the correct direction. I'm not going to put these in as tight as they do from the factory. That's for sure. pretty good okay the new rubbers come with this kind of milky it says it's emulsion temporary rubber assembly lubricant but it just kind of looks like uh, cream get your mind out of the gutter also notice that the uh, the bigger rubber pieces still have their little mold nipples on them so you probably want to take those off Okay, so I'm just going to put this stuff all over it, get nice and coated. All right, over here I have an old clutch hub uh, screwed to uh, the, to the wall here, and I've also got a old steel plate clutch plate with a big old lever on it. What we're going to do is put the uh, clutch center in with the teeth towards the back. Okay, we start with it kind of rotated like this. And we start with the uh, bigger rubber. If you look at it, one side has got kind of a rounded portion to it. That goes towards the uh, spring indentation right there. Right, and this is where my lever comes in handy, and I'm not sure I can do this with one hand. Okay, I have two hands again, so now I can take my little rotating lever here. Oops, go the other way. Now I can compress those. 
and put in the other ones. And release. And now the new clutch rubbers are in. And we can take this whole assembly off. All right, back on the bench, we've got our clutch center with new rubbers in it. All we do is put our plate back on and screw in this side. All right, one reconditioned clutch center. All right, all the clutch components are laid out and I'm really lucky that this clutch is actually in really good condition. Like the clutch center really doesn't have a lot of wear on it. If it was worn, you'd see all these little divots kind of in there from the clutch plates. The inside of the basket shows a little bit of wear. That's not too bad. Some people will file those down. I don't really think it's necessary. The teeth on this are pretty decent. The primary chain's in pretty good shape. You can kind of tell by the, uh, the, the amount of bows and that one seems to be in pretty good condition. Probably one of the most precise ways of checking your chain is you don't want movement of more than a quarter inch every 12 inches. So I've got the chain completely compressed. And if we look here at 12, I can look at the end of that chain link and see that it's only moving, uh, about a sixteenth of an inch so we are well within spec generally the clutch bearings are reusable no problems with them unless there's like some severe scoring in there thrust bearing is often reusable the engine sprocket looks like it's in pretty good used condition so this is a pretty usable clutch and also the uh, Friction plates have a good, good amount of meat left on them, so I'm going to be reusing all these. I took the uh, clutch plates and just put them on some uh, flat concrete and just did some figure eights with them to give them just a little bit of scoring, kind of take some of the glaze off. But anyway, I think we can assemble this now. Alright, to start assembly we take our clutch hub, and I like to take these uh, chip brushes and just put some grease all around the uh, the bearing surface here where the bearing is going to ride. Then we take all 20 little bearings and start putting them on. All right, we have all 20 little piggies in a row. We take our thrust washer, put some grease on it. Lay that over. Okay, then I take some more grease and I just put on the outside of all these bearings. We take our clutch center and before we forget we stick our spring bolts through put that aside all right we take our clutch basket and we capture those bearings Now I grab the uh, I grab the clutch center by holding the bolts. I just stick it right on the splines. Now hopefully this is not a super loose clutch center, so when we lift this whole unit, it doesn't come off.
All right, so this is where it can get a little bit tricky. I've got my shaft with its uh, keyway in, and I want it at 12 o'clock. So what we got to do is we got to basically have the chain on the clutch like this, and we're also looking inside at our keyway, holding it together. We got to slide it over our uh, ignition, and then we got to put our sprocket on. Through there, guys. Come on. There. So we line our keyway. There it goes. Okay. All right. We are officially spinning. We're good there. Everything's on. Put this out of my way. Put in our washer. All right, after the washer, you just put on the clutch nut. There is no tab washer of any kind. You can use some Loctite there, I suppose, if you want, but right now I'm just snugging it up a little bit just to keep things from falling off. I have another clutch locking tool, but this one will work. I can't seem to find the other one. I'm going to take out the clutch rod, push rod, and just tighten this up. tight there will be just a little bit of clutch wobble that's pretty normal it's a floating clutch so don't be alarmed by that all right while I'm thinking about it, we're gonna put the uh, chain tensioner on now so we just line up the slots it just goes right in like that so this is one of the negatives I think about the 500 is that the uh, adjusting screw has to go through the outer case cover on a 650 the there's a little boss right here so this is all one unit but this is has to be removed from the outer case before you can move the case off so looking at this the uh, free play for the chain should be about a half inch and the tensioner has is completely loose at the moment and we're we're measuring just at a half inch, so I think this chain is actually fairly new. Very little wear on it. Next is the uh, clutch push rod. I want to put that in before I get this all buttoned up and forget to put that in because I have done that. Uh, this actually looks pretty good. So it's hardened on both ends, and both ends have a small little chamfer on them. Nothing's been mushroomed out, so we're looking pretty good. Just put some oil on it. Go in like that. All right, next step is the clutch plates. So, uh, like I mentioned, I already took the steel plates and kind of gave them a little uh, surface grinding on some concrete. And I noticed that these friction plates are basically brand new. I mean, they still have all the uh, stampings on them. So this clutch is like practically brand new from what I can tell so I don't pre-oil my uh, friction plates I don't think it's necessary the the oil in the primary is basically there for the chain and a little bit of it mists on the clutch plates and kind of cools them down well, that's about it so I put my clutch plates in dry so we start with a friction plate Steel plate, and back and forth.
All right, to finish up the clutch, we've got the uh, pressure plate with the center adjusting screw, the clutch springs, and the spring holders, and the clutch nuts here. So I've already checked the uh, pressure plate for true. That's nice and flat. And these clutch nuts are totally fine. So normally I replace my uh, clutch springs, but once again, I've become extremely lucky. So these things are 50 millimeters from the factory and two, two, if they're like two to five millimeters shorter than 50 millimeters, <laughs> let me rephrase that. So these things are 50 millimeters from the factory and if they measure somewhere from um, 45 to 48 millimeters, they're, they're kind of worn out and you need to replace them. These are exactly 50 millimeters. They're, ba they're basically brand new. So I'm just going to go ahead and run them. I'm going to start with a little dab of grease on the end of the push rod. I'm going to take my pressure plate and put in all the seal holders. There's a little divot that you line up with. Okay, I'm also going to add a little bit of grease to the back of the adjuster. Alright, we're just going to slip this on. Okay, then we take our springs, put them in. We take our uh, clutch nuts and just kind of push in there and get a couple threads going. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to just take the tool, turn her up. I like to take it down so like about one thread shows. It's a starting spot. Anyway, that's about as far as we can really take it until the, the motor is in the bike where you can actually pull the, uh, the clutch lever and, and adjust your plate for uh, levelness. So we'll stop it right here. I've turned the motor on its front section here and I've removed the, uh, the drain plug and the screen and it, it was very dirty and you can see just how much goop is in there so that needs to be cleaned very well and also while I'm here I'm gonna put that oil banjo whatever this is called oil feed back on and it's gonna be a little challenging I'm gonna admit it's a little bit tight in there but I'm not gonna record it because I know I'm gonna cuss a lot but I'm gonna try my best I really don't want to take the cover back off so let's see how that goes well, I got the oil junction on, and it wasn't too bad. I don't think I said any cuss words. Uh, basically, what I had to do is I had to modify a quarter-inch regular 7 16 socket to be able to fit inside there. And I had to put it on loose and kind of tap it on and, uh, you know, tighten it up that way. Uh, yeah, it was probably easier to take this off, but it kind of became a challenge that I want to be able to do this, and I know I can do it. And I did. So if you find yourself in that situation, that's how you can get around it. But my best advice is put the oil junction on before you put the outer gearbox cover on. I also cleaned out the drain, but I'm not going to put the cover on yet because when I pull the timing cover, I'm going to pull the oil pump as well and kind of blow out the lines here. So I want to keep this open for now. Like I mentioned, since we're going with the electrics kit, 
this point housing has no value whatsoever anymore. So we can completely remove this. And this really does become just a cover that you can easily pull off and on and access anything in here. So we're gonna remove the uh, points plate. I'm really glad I don't have to mess with this uh, point system anymore. I tell you, the uh, stuff you can get now is just so much better than it's ever been. All right, I can disconnect it from down here. Now we can pull this through, maybe. Come on. I'm sure there's a little bit of sealant right there. Oh. Is it coming? There we go. I'm gonna pull the uh, outer cover right off. <laughs> Okay then. Wow. Now we have the advance unit here. Literally all this just goes away, which is just amazing. I had to actually lay the motor on the side because I just couldn't get any good leverage, but I got them all loose. They're all pretty sticky. So let's see what's going on behind here. Yeah, that was pretty rough. They put some sort of sealant on all the screws. It might be even case sealant, I'm not sure, but uh, they're all out. So let's see what we're dealing with here. hearing that sound difference. It's kind of stuck on this side a little bit. There we go. Here we go. Let me get my rag just to write in case. Nothing exciting. Uh, nothing too surprising in here. Uh, I'm gonna pull the oil pump off. Now, normally I replace these with Morgos, and I probably still should, but again, I spent all my allowance for the month, so I might have to live with that for a bit. I've had some uh, bad luck with used uh, oil pumps they usually cost me hundreds of dollars in repairs for using them even if I try to rebuild them so let me stew on that for a bit one more thing I forgot to say uh, whoever put this timing cover on was extremely irresponsible it should be using a, a gasket instead they use some sort of case sealant and this stuff just flakes right off and can go right into your motor and get picked up by the uh, pump and sent through the motor and locked up. Not good. Okay, after removing the two nuts for the oil pump, it just simply pulls right off. All right, to finish this up, I'm gonna go ahead and take off the uh, pressure release valve. And this is uh, the, the post pre-unit style where there's no indicator button on this. Oh, that was not even tight. Oh, that little bit of 
sludgy sludge. Okay, I'm gonna clean this area up. I'm gonna take apart the pressure release valve, clean it up and see how it looks inside. I'm gonna blow out these lines. It'll clean out the pickup tube down here. And that's pretty much it on the side. All right, now I'm gonna kinda clean up the timing side a little bit. I'm gonna clean the cover. I'm gonna replace that oil seal. I also had to shim the posts with a couple washers just so they stand a little bit proud of that because now that the points plate's not in there, those posts are a little bit too low and you want them to stick up just a little bit for the, uh, the cover because as you see the, the cover is recessed just a little bit down there. Alright, I'm going to pop this oil seal out, Let's see if I can just push it out. All right, next I'm gonna blow out my uh, return line. So this is the return, rear return. It has uh, basically twice as much capacity to return as it does to feed, because you want the oil out of there. So I'm gonna spray some uh, brake clean in there. This will go to the scavenge pipe on the bottom underneath the screen. And this goes to the uh, actual pipe fitting that goes to the oil tank. You can spray brake cleaner in all these different holes if all your covers are undone except this hole right here because this is the hole that feeds the oil to your crank down here then comes around to the pressure release valve and sends oil up to the the cams up here so you don't want to put any brake cleaner in there or you're going to basically be preloading your crank with brake cleaner all right, now that the cover is clean, we're going to put our new oil seal in. And again, the spring faces this way because we don't want the oil to go that way. And that's pretty much it for the timing side. I've decided I am going to save up and uh, get myself a Morgo oil pump just for the peace of mind. So we'll get that on next time if I get it. And now you got a handy dandy little stash box. Hmm, what could you put in there? Webco Industries. And here's the pressure release valve. It's a lot simpler than a pre-unit one. You basically just have a little piston and spring that uh, once it re reaches a certain pressure, it kind of redirects the oil. These are the old uh, fiber washers. These are the new ones. My kit only came with this one, so I had to hunt for one in my stash box. So I'll get this back together. All right, it's time to put the drain back in. Uh, there's a little fiber washer on top of the screen. You'll notice it's a conical shape that cone points down and the spring rests on top of it. I also put some Hylomar on the fiber washer for the plug itself. The timing side drain plug got a freshly annealed copper washer and that put back in. All right, let's get on to the main event of this video and get this Electrix World ignition kit installed. All right, from the very beginning, I've been trying to decide what orientation makes the most sense for this, uh, this pickup. And I originally thought I was gonna put it in something like this, but I think I'm gonna put it down like this. 
I can kind of wrap this uh, uh, cable on the other side of that post and then it'll fit right in there. It won't have any contact with the chain. In fact, the post kind of protects it from the chain. And so what we're going to do is we're going to install it center in the slot so we have play either direction. I've already done some dry fitment on this. So I know I need to not only put on the spacers that they in included, but I need to put on three spacing washers for the nuts. It's always good to do kind of a dry fitment of all your parts before you really install them. I'm going to go ahead and tighten it up. All right, so that's our starting point. All right, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to find top dead center on the timing side compression stroke. I don't think it matters which side is top dead center. I have a feeling this thing fires both spark plugs at the same time. But it's just kind of good practices for other bikes. So to do that, I'm going to spin the uh, motor from the timing side until I put my finger in the timing side spark plug hole until I feel pressure pushing it out. That means it's on the compression stroke on the timing side. Right there, it's starting to push out. So now I'm going to look down the spark plug hole and look for the piston to come just about the top here. All right, we're about right there. Now, on the later engine bikes, you actually have a timing plug hole, and that makes your life so much easier. If you don't have that, you're going to have to go the old school route of using a degree wheel and a piston stop to find top dead center and 38 degrees before top dead center. But with the timing plug hole, there's actually a divot in the crank for top dead center and 38 degrees before top dead center. So all you do is you screw this, this little simple tool in. And you put the little peg in so we're going to move the crank until it just registers, right there. So it fell into a little divot and now you can't move the crank if you hold it in. That's top dead center for compression stroke. So we want to find 38 degrees before top dead center. So you pull your plug back out and you rotate the crank backwards. I like to go just a little bit beyond. 38 before maybe like 50 all right so right now the peg is not registered anything we're going backwards and I'm waiting to feel that divot I think I missed it try going back forward There we go. That's 38 before top dead center. So now we're keyed in. The crank is set at 38 degrees before top dead center. It just happens that the keyway is actually at 12 o'clock for 38. So again, if you look at the crank, at top dead center, the, the keyway is a little bit to the left right there. And at 38 degrees top dead center, you can see the keyway is pretty much vertical. Again, when you come up to 38, you want to start past 38, like at maybe 50 degrees, and work your way up. That kind of uh, takes up for any sort of valve lash that would be in there. 
right there. That's 38 before top dead center. So easy on these later bikes. I've always wanted to make a mod for like a pre-unit to use this tool. I think it might be a little bit more complicated than I think, and I certainly don't have the capabilities to do that. But if you have that, your life is much easier. Okay, the kit comes with a tapered collet and two of these spacers. The instructions say to put this collet right up against the, uh, the sprocket. But I know from dry fitment that if I do that, I feel like the rotor assembly is gonna be too far in. So I actually will go ahead and uh, add the first spacer. Then we put in the collet. I'm not gonna put the collet over the, uh, the keyway. I wanna rotate it. Right there's the other spacer. It's kind of stuck in there from the magnetism. So uh, you'll notice there's a red dot on the pickup and a red marking on your rotor. It couldn't be easier than this, guys. All you do is you slip on your rotor and you line it up with that dot. That means it's going to fire at that dot. Then all we do is we put on the, uh, the nut and we tighten it up. It's going to pull that up against that tapered collet. It's going to be very tight. The directions don't say to use any sort of tab washer or anything, so I guess I won't use one. Okay, all I do now is just tighten up the rotor. It's going to pull it on that collet real tight. I'm holding the crank from the other side. Even though the pin will keep it in position, I'm holding the crank from the other side. It's pretty tight. So if you look here, the line is lined up with the dot pretty much and you can see why I added that spacer. If I didn't have that spacer, that rotor would be further back into the pickup. And I wanted it a little bit more proud than it was. Okay, that's about it. That's as far as you can really take it until it's in the bike and running. Uh, what you need to do now is strobe time it. And I'll do that when it's back in the bike. On 68 and later bikes, they actually have a window here in the case that you can use a strobe timer for and kind of get through. You shouldn't run it without the uh, chain tensioner in position. Um, I might pick up a earlier case just so I can do that or maybe pop one off my 68. I don't think I should get, should try to run this. Even though it's like already in spec, I don't think I should run this with this thing flopping around. So that's pretty much it. It's set. Oh, one more thing before I forget. You are going to want to seal this up. I'm going to do that after I verify the timing and everything once it's in the bike. Let's see if it works. All right, I have it kind of just temporarily set up. Uh, the instructions say that the black wire goes into one, white center, and blue on number three. The wires to the coil don't matter which connect to who. Also... It says that you cannot just test one plug. You got to test them both at the same time because apparently the ground runs through one plug into the next through the head. All right, here goes nothing. There we go. All right, everybody, I think that wraps up this video. We've got spark, so that's good. I actually was going to rebuild the carburetor in this video, but this one was running a little bit long, so we'll put that in a short next video. Thanks for watching.